If I was sitting in that classroom and all of a sudden, you know, uh, the, the, the administrative officer of the school came in and said, okay, you uh, four uh, white gentlemen in the front, you leave because we have some less qualified uh, applicants from different races that are now going to take your place. And so, you know, that's really the question of what, what can or can't a public university do in those cases. So in my paper, I will be focusing on the use of race-based admissions policies on the part of public universities to promote racially diverse student bodies. I don't know how much of uh, an issue this is in India, whether you've confronted it or it's an, an active issue. Under these policies, public universities' admissions officials assign a so-called plus factor for minority applicants, such as African American or Hispanic students. In some cases, the additional weight given to a minority student's application arising from this plus factor is enough to secure him or her a spot at the university that otherwise might have been awarded to an equally or better qualified non-minority student. Before beginning my analysis of the legal landscape, I would like to briefly discuss the practical and political landscape of affirmative action admissions policies. Over the past few decades in America, as the condition of state-run public and secondary schools attended by African American and Hispanic students have declined, together with a decline in two-parent households, so has the number of qualified university applicants from these minority groups. In many cases, especially in public urban school districts, some high schools socially promote minority students, regardless of whether they have met the academic criteria for advancement from one grade to the next. Thus, upon graduation from secondary school, if they are admitted to a public university, these students are often unpre unprepared for the coursework. As a result, upon entering college, many of them need extensive remedial coursework or drop out and attend less elite public community colleges. Unless public universities use affirmative action race-based admissions policies, the admission rates for African American or Hispanic students are very low. Thus, to avoid political pressure and the appearance of racial discrimination, public universities sometimes rely on affirmative action policies. Yet those, uh, the use of these policies give rise to legal challenges brought by non-minority students who believe that this form of reverse discrimination violates the Equal Protection Clause of the 14, 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution. Now I'll briefly discuss uh, recent decisions of the Supreme Court of the United States uh, in this area. Of course, the landmark case is the Bakke decision from the 1970s, which talked about the uh, 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 ability of uh, admissions officials to use race to create a diverse student body. Uh, but in more recent cases articulating a more further development of that case law. The 2003 decision of the U.S. Supreme Court in Grutter v. Bollinger is the guiding case law relating to the use of affirmative action programs in determining who gets admitted to public universities. The Grutter case involved the University of Michigan Law School's attempt to implement a race-based admissions policy to increase student body diversity. The case originated when the Michigan uh, Law School denied admission to Barbara Grutter, a female Michigan resident with a three-point grade point average and a 161 law school admissions test score. After being denied admissions, she filed a lawsuit alleging three things. First, that the university had discriminated against her on the basis of race in violation of the 14th Amendment and Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Second, she alleged that she was rejected because the law school used race as a predominant factor giving applicants belonging to certain minority groups a significantly greater chance of admission than students with similar credentials from disfavored racial groups. And third, she alleged that the university had no compelling interest to justify the use of race in its admissions decisions. Lee Bollinger was the president of the University of Michigan at the uh, time, and he was named as a defendant in the case. When uh, the case went to court, the university argued that the law school had a compelling interest to ensure that its student body contained a critical mass of students from minority groups, particularly African Americans and Hispanics. The university argued that 
Achieving such a critical mass of diversity had three aims. First, to ensure that minority students do not feel isolated or do not feel as though they are spokespersons in their classes for their race. Two, to provide adequate opportunities for the type of student interaction that can promote the educational benefits of diversity. And the three reason the university gave, third reason was to challenge all students to think critically and re-examine racial stereotypes. In the case, the United States Supreme Court agreed with the university that affirmative action admissions policies could be used to promote the educational benefits of diversity. The majority ruling, authored by Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, held that the United States Constitution, quote, does not prohibit the law school's narrowly tailored use of race in admissions decisions to further a compelling interest in obtaining the educational benefits that flow from a diverse student body, end quote. The court held that the law school's interest in obtaining a critical mass of minority students was indeed a tailored use of the affirmative action policy. Justice O'Connor noted that sometime in the future, perhaps in 25 years, racial, uh, racial affirmative action would no longer be necessary in order to promote diversity. Thus, the court's opinion implied that affirmative action should not be allowed permanent status and that eventually a colorblind policy should be implemented. Justices O'Connor, Stephen, Souter, Ginsburg, and Breyer were in the majority. Chief Justice Rehnquist and Justices Scalia, Kennedy, and Thomas dissented. Much of the dissent concerned a disbelief in the validity of the law school's claim that affirmative action was necessary to create a critical mass of minority students and to provide a diverse educational background. In fact, Justice Thomas noted that in California, where voters had adopted State Proposition 209, barring public universities from granting preferential treatment on the basis of race, the University of California, Berkeley School of Law had been, had been able to achieve a diverse student body without relying on affirmative action. Justice Thomas, who is African American, also maintained that because affirmative action policies favor some groups of citizens over others, the practice violates the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which guarantees citizens equal protection under the law. Since the Grutter decision in 2003, public universities and other public institutions of higher education across the nation have been allowed to use race as that plus factor in determining whether a student should be admitted. While race may not be the only factor, the court's decision allows admissions officials in reviewing a student's application to consider race along with other individualized factors such as a work experience, extracurricular activities, or unique travel or other life experiences. The court's opinion positively answered the question as to whether diversity in higher education is a compelling governmental interest. As long as the program is narrowly tailored to achieve that end, it seems likely that the court will find it constitutional. After the Supreme Court's decision in Grutter, opponents of affirmative action in, in Michigan took action. They circulated petitions around the state to change the Michigan State Constitution. The measure, called the Michigan Civil Rights Proposal II, which voters approved, prohibits the use of race in the law school admissions process. In this respect, Proposal II was similar to California's Proposition 209 and Washington's Initiative 200 and other state initiatives that banned the use of race in public university admissions. After the passage of Proposal II in Michigan, a lawsuit was brought challenging its ban on the use of affirmative action in public universities. On March 25th of 2013, in the case of Shewitt versus Coalition to Defend Affirmative Action, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the Michigan ban on the use of race-based admissions policies. The Shewitt decision opened the door for other states in the United States to amend their constitutions to prohibit the use of race as a consideration in admitting students to public universities. So in the United States, unless a state has amended its constitution to forbid the use of affirmative action admissions policies, in making its de admissions decisions, a public university may uh, use race as one of several individual factors. However, in designing those admissions policies, the universities must uh, follow the court's requirement that the policies be narrowly tailored to achieve the compelling uh, state interests of a racially diverse student body. So, Presently in the United States, a controversy exists 
uh, over whether universities are in fact applying the Supreme Court's strict scrutiny test uh, from the Grutter case. In 2013, in the case of Fisher versus University of Texas, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned a federal appeals court decision that had upheld the university's affirmative action admissions policies. The U.S. Supreme Court determined that in deciding that case, the, the circuit court had used the wrong standard of review. Of review. Uh, the circuit court uh, had merely looked at what the University of Texas was doing in the ways of admissions policies it's, it, and its race-based criteria, and it said that it had acted in good faith. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, instead said that uh, the burden uh, of evidence lies with the university to prove that its admissions program is narrowly tailored to obtain the educational benefits of diversity. So the Supreme Court remanded the case back to the Fifth Circuit saying, look, we, we gave you a test. You need to determine whether the admissions policies of University of Texas are narrowly tailored. We don't think you did a thorough examination of that. Please apply our standard properly. After reconsidering the case using the, the standard of review the court had dictated, the Fifth Circuit again ruled in favor of the university admissions policy. The student, Abigail Fisher, petitioned to the Supreme Court to review the Fifth Circuit's decision, and the court, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court, has agreed to hear this case uh, in its next term. So it is conceivable right now that Chief Justice Roberts and Justices Kennedy, Scalia, Thomas, and Alito may be prepared to overturn Grutter, which many experts viewed as an interim decision designed to buy policymakers and politicians time to remedy the underlying unequal educational outcomes that make it necessary to reward minority students with a plus factor. In any case, these justices are likely to more closely evaluate whether race-based admissions policies are really necessary to achieve a diverse student body. They'll also look at whether a race-based admission policy can ever be narrowly tailored to achieve racial diversity and whether the equal protection guarantee of the 14th Amendment should be the paramount consideration. Really, when one thinks about it, are there really any means of generating reliable evidence that having a critical mass of African American or Hispanic students in a law class advances the educational experience uh, of the members of that class? I mean, imagine yourself, uh, our law school admissions office is going to admit only minority students who have a record of engaging in debates about race. Uh, our camera's going to be installed in law school classrooms to learn about whether the minority students who have been admitted are prompting or participating in enriching discussions about race. Uh, will admissions officials instruct professors to send their, them copies of any essay test responses that provide evidence that a classroom discussion about race relations has changed a white or Asian student's perspective? In short, how can the educational value of uh, diversity be objectively measured? Further, what should one make of the important takeaway from Justice Clarence Thomas's concurring opinion in the Fisher case involving the University of Texas? He reflected that affirmative action admissions programs actually may harm racial minorities more than they help them. In, other, in his words, quote, blacks and Hispanics admitted to the university as a result of racial discrimination are, on average, far less prepared than their white and Asian classmates. Any blacks and Hispanics who likely would have excelled at less elite schools are placed in a position where underperformance at the more elite school is all but inevitable because they are less academically prepared than the white and Asian students with whom they must compete. As it turns out, Justice Thomas may be right. In the area of college and professional school admissions, recent research indicates that affirmative action policies may harm minority students. The research shows that many of these students underperform academically, become discouraged, and change their degree majors to less challenging and less professionally rewarding ones. The research also indicates that because the academic abilities of many affirmative action law students are mismatched with the rigorous requirements of the degree programs they are pursuing and with the ability of the more qualified students, they do not perform as well and lose out on job opportunities in a competitive law hiring marketplace. In conclusion, the debate over race-based public university admissions policies is a very important one. For many years, these policies have been used to make up for the unequal educational outcomes that have resulted from a failure of state-run public elementary and secondary schools to adequately educate minority students for admission to elite, elite public universities. Instead of penalizing qualified non-minority applicants to public universities, 
state officials need to start improving the educational outcomes at the K through 12 level. Rather than protecting the government monopoly over public education and the influence of special interest groups on that monopoly, state officials should focus on promoting educational choices, competition, and innovative public community and private schools. Thank you.